FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Gold Corp. U.S. Gold Corp. is a U.S.-focused gold exploration and development company advancing high-potential projects in Wyoming and Nevada. U.S. Gold Corp. has consolidated a district on Nevada's productive cortex trend and is advancing the Copper King project towards production in Wyoming, led by a team of prolific company builders and renowned explorers, including Dave Mathewson, who is directly responsible for several major Nevada gold discoveries. U.S. Gold Corp. is well-capitalized and has an extremely tight share structure with less than $20 million shares outstanding and trades on the NASDAQ, a major exchange under the ticker symbol USAU. To learn more, go to usgoldcorp.gold. That's usgoldcorp.gold. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 52019. Hey, as always, be a part of the show. Join us. Email kl at kerrylutz.com with any questions, comments, feedback, anger, venting. You know, we're here for therapy as much as we are for information. So whatever it is, just rant on. Hey, well, speaking of ranting on, price of gold has been slammed down yet again. What about that COT report? I just don't get it. Those speculators just seem to love losing money. No matter what happens, the speculators always lose. Something wrong with that picture, isn't there? Well, there's nothing wrong with this picture. Ned Schmidt, the Value View Gold Report and the AgriFood Value View is with us now. Ned, hey, happy Monday. Happy Monday. Uh, glad to be alive. So what about uh, gold and precious metals? Silver is getting destroyed. Is this just a seasonal type of uh, seasonal, what they call it, when uh, you don't get any sun in the winter, they call it sad seasonal ap- adaptative disorder or d- adaptive disorder. Are we having uh, gold? We're having GAD gold or PM ad precious metals adaptive disorder. Is that what we're having? <laughs> it may be. No, it's, it's, we're, we're hang- the markets are hanging on to this view that the technology stocks are still going to save them. And they haven't recognized yet that the technology stocks are failing them. They're failing them in a historical context. Silver is 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 beat down this week as silver can get. I mean, the it, short-term indicators all started screaming by last week. The I- intermediate type indicators are all on silver screaming by this week. And I think what happened is. These tech freaks, and I'm sorry, Terry, these people have a mental disorder. <laughs> Technology <laughs> is wonderful, can only save them. They ran over, and, and when they got worried about trade and recessions, they go buy Bitcoin, imaginary money. And if, if you look at a six month chart of Bitcoin, it's risen in a parabolic rise from roughly four grand to eight grand. Mm-hmm. That formation always failed yeah. dramatically. And I think that the money that normally would have gone into silver is all we're chasing imaginary money. Mm-hmm. And oh. I don't think that'll last. You know, I'm a, I prefer to read history and, and one of their, Period. I'm going back and look at is is what gold bugs like Terry and I truly understand is what happened in 1929, 1930. The stock market was roaring in the 20s, and it was a technology market. RCA was a hot stock. That's Radio Corporation of America. They were, bring, they were bringing commercial radio to the nation in the 1920s. And the impact on communication of the re- commercial radio far exceeds the iPhone. Let me guarantee you that. Yeah. A dozen years later, 
Franklin Roosevelt would announce to the nation we were at war over radio. Mm -hmm. IBM. Sorry, folks. IBM is the godfather of tech stock. In 1927, IBM traded at $54. In 1929, at the height of the bubble, it traded for $216. What is that, a four-time rise? You know, by nine, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, Gary. I was going to say, you know, that uh, IBM uh, began life as the computing, tabulating, and recording company, otherwise known as CTR. So, uh, and then it became IBM, I guess, later on in the 20s, I think, or and it was started. You know, they started uh, their first big order was census tabulation equipment. And that was kind of the predecessor of the punch card, which most of you out there are probably too young to remember, but uh, they were nothing but aggravation punch cards. I used to use them on <laughs> if the you've never used roads. an IBM punch card machine, you don't understand the history of technology. Yeah. It was it was like it was like using a uh a I don't know type. what. It was like you know, a, a build a fire in your fireplace to cook dinner. Yeah, it was like a early linotype machines. It was the same kind of thing, you know, totally electromechanical. There were no transistors or anything to control it and make it efficient. It wasn't till much later that it became that. And I actually lit, used to live in the town where IBM was headquartered, but that's a story for another day. So anyways, so, so you're saying, uh, so it was up to how much, uh, before the, uh, before the crash and then how much after it, it was at 216 at the top of the bubble by 1932, it was at $9. <laughs> so, but what happened to send IBM to $200 and then to nine is what we want to key on because we made some mistakes. The consequence of those mistakes was the Great Depression and the Great Crash in the U.S. stock market. Now, history is not a template, Gary. It mm -hmm. doesn't create the exact same result. But what caused the problem is in 29, the Federal Reserve started tightening. And today, the Federal Reserve has been tightening, continues to tighten. Uh, the next thing that happened was, big thing, was in early 1930, we passed, the United States passed the smooth hauling Tariff Act, which increased U.S. tariffs by 40%. That set off a tariff war around the world. So those two events contributed to the crash of 29 and the Great Depression. Now, the investment that was king in 1930 it would be for the next ten years was cash, real money. Yeah. If you had cash, if you had cash, you were rich. If you had stock, you were broke, unable to feed your family. Now, gold at that time, we we were on what was called a gold standard, but it was a dirty gold standard. Nobody nobody followed the rule, and then Roosevelt outlawed gold. But you know, bring us back to the today, where we have the Fed tightening, we have a, and I had hope a week ago, maybe 10 days ago, Terry, that this trade tiff would iron out, but I think the Chinese torpedoed it. Apparently, nobody in that country has ever read John Nash, so that's fairly clear. So tell us, what did John Nash say about these types of things? John Nash, John Nash was the guy that invented game, not invented it, advanced Game, game theory. theory. Right. And it's what kept us out of nuclear war. The, the movie is Brilliant Mind. Oh, of course. It's, yeah, John Nash. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, anyhow, when they reneged on the deal and imposed tariffs on the rest of the U.S. import, and then Trump raised it on $200 million, that is a putting us back into that horrible set of circumstances that happened in 1930. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese are making a big mistake. They're saying, we're just going to wait till Trump's thrown out of office in two years. Well, 
as the pollsters learn, they're not so smart. You like know, in Australia, is, right? Yeah. Was that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was as bad as the 2016 forecast. Actually, it was worse. <laughs> it was really worse. Because they were running on the basically the Green New Deal for Australia, anti-mining, anti-progress, uh, and pro-windmills and uh, solar cells and climate change, and totally repudiated. Open border, and open borders. Oh, and open... Yeah, well, why wouldn't you want open borders, Ned? Come on. <laughs> get real here. Open borders, good. Orange man, bad. Right? Right. Orange man, so bad. This, history tells us there's going to be something bad in terms of economic consequences. Yep. And, and the two that we remember from the 30s was the technology stock market crash, which mm -hmm. I think you can expect, and there was some kind of economic problem. Now, what are the alternatives today? So you can go to cash or you can go to gold. And gold is in a freer market than it was in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And so I think gold is clearly an alternative. I mean, it's interesting this morning. I put at one point this morning, the GLD was down one and a half percent from a year ago. And Apple was down 3% from a year ago. And, and, it's already starting, and I think it's the fact that gold, while it's down from that 1340 we love, mm -hmm. is, is, is the only real alternative out there. Yeah. Aside from just owning cash. And, and I think investors need to start realizing that there are always two positions wrong in a portfolio, 0% and 100%. So you've got zero percent in gold in your portfolio. You're just not there. Okay, mm -hmm. you're have a very high risk portfolio, mm. and uh, I think investors need to aware of that. And then, as we were talking earlier, I think it's interesting. Is Carrie is a Dr. Judy Shelton, mm -hmm. right. who looks like he's been looked at by Trump as a Federal Reserve Board appointee. And if you look at her, she gets more and more positive. She's a graduate at the University of Utah, where she got her PhD. So she got her PhD. She's a woman. They would like to appoint another woman. And mm -hmm. she's from the West. There's always been a preference to have the Federal Reserve Board geographically balanced. So, so that, she's not transgender? I mean, uh, how will the Democrats ever no, go she, along with that? <laughs> You're going to get us in trouble, okay? But she's a real woman. A real woman, okay. Yeah. Not a not a self-identified uh, woman. No. <laughs> okay. There is a difference here. You know that, Ned. You do know that, right? I'm not going to talk to you about it. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of people I wouldn't find P.O. on this morning, but I don't want to start back. Oh, well, we're starting off early, and it is Monday, so why not? Hey, um, I just want to play you a little rap song. It's the only rap song that I can tolerate. Uh, play you a couple bars, <laughs> but I think you're going to enjoy it. Here, listen. Bad orange man, bad orange man, bad orange man, bad orange man, bad orange man. So you have any idea who they're talking about there? <laughs> At my age, that's gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little spoof on Trump haters because they say they call him Orange Man. So the pro-Trump people, it's become a meme. Orange Man bad. Orange Man bad. Because it's just like... <laughs> It's just like saying Russians bad, you know, communist bad, <laughs> orange man bad. You know, it's a non-thinking pre-programmed soundbite that the insane uh, left has clamped onto like a, you know, like, like a Doberman pincher with a, uh, a fresh, uh, fresh bone, you know, can't let go of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, Terry, you're wound this morning. Hey, man, I'm wound all right. Hey. I was away in Savannah for a couple of days. What a gorgeous city. And what's really weird, Ned, is they laid the city out in 1780-something. One guy with a pencil and paper, and he put in public squares, and he put in a grid. Streets going north, streets going south, streets going east, streets going west. It's a grid. And the thing works to this day. The traffic downtown is not terrible in that old section. Um, there's no traffic lights. There's just stop signs. It is the most incredible place I've ever been to. So I'm definitely on a roll here, like history, the role of history, and why you need to study it for sure. So hey, so we got all this interesting stuff, palace intrigue, but in the well, meantime... Well, wait, a, yeah. wait a minute. So on Savannah, now, Terry is giving you that this is a beautiful, old-fashioned southern city. It is also one of the hottest party towns Yes. For young people. <laughs> yeah. It's... So you hear that you hear that your granddaughter's going to stop in Savannah while going somewhere. She's not going for the culture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is like a clean, nice New Orleans. You know, that's what I kind of looked at it like, and so much history. <laughs> but on on Doctor Doctor Shelton, what I want to do a search for an article on Doctor Shelton. It was published by Fortune in 2016, in which she talks about her belief in a gold standard, why she believes in a, a gold standard. And, and this would be the first time ever. Well, Greenspan was a lukewarm gold standard guy, but this would be the first time we would actually have somebody on the board besides her be a gold standard. Yeah, that would be a shock. Well, they can't let her in, right? Yeah, you know, Terry, too, we have, we have two presidential candidates that this weekend advocated a postal savings system. Now, I don't want to say these two people are dumb, <laughs> but we had a postal savings system. Yeah, like you could put, you could deposit money with the postal, have a postal account, right? Yeah, it was opened in 1911. And it was shut down in 1967 because nobody wanted to use it. Well, nobody knew about it, and they were inefficient. It was like uh, you had a passbook kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, right. And we're going to like I, trust the post office with our money. Yes. Makes total sense <laughs> to me. And, I, and I'm still waiting for a book that's supposed to be coming in the mail. Oh, I've got stuff, you know. Like, basically... I've said this before, I'll say it again. They should just give the post office to Jeff Bezos because it's his own personal delivery service anyway. Most of what they're doing now is just delivering Amazon packages. So, you know, to say, Jeff, if you like it so much, it's yours. Do what you want with it and just don't bother us anymore. Close it, raise it. We don't care. Just take it off our hands. <laughs> well, somebody called it. The postal system is actually a retirement plan that delivers packages on the side. Yeah. <laughs> well, my uh, one of my guys who used to work for me as a messenger said, a mailman is just an overpaid messenger. So take take from that what you will. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, where do they get these ideas from? It didn't work then. They shut it down because of total apathy and disinterest and non-use, but now it's going to come back. It's just genius, pure genius. So Ned, one of the calls you made, and you've been talking about it uh, for months with us now, is hogs and the, uh, the African swine flu that's been sweeping across China relentlessly. I think they lost a third of their, their herd of, of hogs. You do call it a herd, Well, right? China, China this year would have produced a billion hogs. And the early estimates are that their actual hog production will be down 300 million hogs. Yeah, damn I mean, near a third. We're talking about a lot of hogs here, yeah. folks. <laughs> and yeah. even if we didn't have tariffs on U.S. ag products, China wasn't going to buy much as much soybeans because that's one 
one little educational moment I want to give, Gary, because of some comments I read this weekend. It said, well, the only reason we produce soybeans is to export them. I'm sorry, folks. Soybeans are where your bacon and eggs come from. <laughs> Chickens are fed soybeans so they can produce eggs. Hogs are fed soybeans so you can have your bacon. Uh-huh. It's and the ham. same with China. Yes. And you have to feed a chicken every day, not the day you need an egg. Okay? <laughs> it's kind of investing in the future when you feed a chicken, right? So, right. So China has been importing our pork in massive accounts. I, I think their sales were up this year to like 200,000 tons versus almost none last year. That's a lot of pork. And Hong Kong. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's a lot of pork. And Hong Kong, I don't know what they're doing with all the beef in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has been buying beef hand over foot. Yes, and that's probably getting imported into China somehow. So Mm -hmm. that's going on. And while the tariffs had hurt the prices for corn and soybeans, turns out Mother Nature is bigger than the Chinese party in China. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> uh, Anyhow, amazing. about a month or two ago, these giant storms hit the upper Midwestern U.S. Snow, sleet, rain, in quantities that you can't imagine. Now, the problem was the ground was frozen. So all this rain and sleet and snow couldn't be soaked into the ground. It went into the river, which flooded their banks, which flooded the cornfields, which means the farmers can't get in their cornfields. Now, every Monday at 4 o'clock, the USDA reduces what we call the crop progress report. It tells us how much ground has been planted by farmers. Now, we haven't got the Monday report for this week. But it was way, way down. We got last week. It was like less than half. Only 30% of our corn acres had been planted. The five-year average is 66%. So we've only, as Terry said, planted half the corn acres we should have asked last week. Illinois, big corn producer, they were at 11%. Versus 82%. And today, when Carrie and I are talking, is May 20th. This is kind of the traditional drop dead day. Everything planted from this day on will produce less coin and corn than we thought, because the yields degrade. Now, because the corn is late, we plant soybeans after we plant corn. Corn has a long, lower, longer growing cycle. Soybeans were at nine percent versus twenty nine percent. Well, all this means is the industry is finally waking up to the fact that our harvests are going to be smaller than we thought, and prices have moved up strongly. Friday's price on corn. One I used was at three seventy five a bushel. The fifty two week average, I mean fifty two week low, corn ed, fifty two week high, is three seventy seven. So we've got corn at a fifty two week high. Wow. We got sorghum at a fifty two week high. What do you do with that? We, stuff we got again? soy. What do you do with sorghum? Rally. What do you do with sorghum? Sorghum is a corn alternative. Uh, it's cattle feed. It's a big place it goes. Mm-hmm. And starches and, and booze. The Chinese used to buy, buy it, make booze with it. Mm-hmm. and Because uh, it's non-GMO. Uh-huh. Now, this, now, all that storm I was telling you about, it closed the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River, north of St. Louis, has been closed to barge traffic since May 2nd. Now, when the When the river is closed, there is no point in buying grain from a farmer in Iowa because you can't move it anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
grain has to go down the Mississippi River to the Gulf. Right. To New Orleans. So nobody was buying grain. So the grain prices in Iowa collapsed. Well, last week, they op- opened the river back up. And now grains are grains are draining. That's also pushing prices up. So it looks like the situation is going to improve for the American farmer. Not going to be rosy, but it'll, it'll be better. Mm-hmm. Wow. One, just one to... of the things that I have long thought, Gary, is that animal proteins were the long-term shortage problem. I mean, if we look out 20 years ago, your, children, your grandchildren will probably never see a T-bone steak, that kind of stuff. Really? Because you won't, can't afford it. Oh, my God. So really? The, meat, the Americas, when I say the Americas, I'm talking about Canada, U.S., Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and everything in between. We are ideal for producing animals. Mm-hmm. We've got the grains, the climate, the pastures. The, the future for Americans for farming in the Americas is animal protein. And corn and soybeans are at the low end of the value chain. So I'm looking at companies that produce meat. Now, these companies, Gary, I will warn listeners, they're, they're low price stock, so traders do crazy things with them. So you've got to be careful. Don't buy at the high. Mm-hmm. One, that's been at, one that's been at the 52-week high that we've talked about before is JBS. Right. The trade, trades in the United States is JBSAY. The largest beef company in the world. Most of its revenues coming in from the United States. It owns Pilgrim's Pride and Swift. And hopefully, maybe by the end of this year, this company will be listed in the United States, which means it will become a must-own stock by portfolio manager. The next one in that beef category that hasn't been quite as hot is MRRTY, another Brazilian company with most of its revenues outside of Brazil. It bought national beef in the United States. It was now a big beef company. Another one that has been hot lately <coughs> is BRFS. Another Brazilian company. It's the largest chicken exporter in the world. Mm-hmm. In, por- in pork, we don't have as clean a situation. The company is, is WH Group. Another Asian company Largest pork company in the world. The ADR is W-H-E-L-Y. But like I said, Terry, again, people, be careful when you buy these. They're, they're, they're not, they don't trade a lot, and the traders like to whip them around. Sure. They'll whip you around. You know they will. You get whipsawed, yeah. Nobody cares about the little guy out there. Why would they? <laughs> Why would they? Well, it's an interesting uh, case that's unfolding here. Interesting scenario. I guess it's good to be a farmer again, but not so good to be a consumer. So we can expect to see meat prices, pig prices, kind of everything go higher in the coming weeks and months ahead, right? Right. And, and the, you know, the thing is, Terry, on the pork, like we're, we, we've talked about African swine flu. It's a virus. So you can't cure it. Right. In Hong Kong last week had to kill 6,000 hogs that they discovered with it. It's the only cure for it mm. until somebody comes up with a vaccine. Right. So you don't know when that, if that's ever going to happen. That's a big if. We don't know. We really don't know. <laughs> Those things are hit or miss. You know, where's our Jonas, yeah. our next Jonas sock for pigs? Yeah. And no matter how many iPhones we have it can't change that can't cure uh african uh, swine flu with uh with a with an iphone you're telling me <laughs> i thought you could no do anything iPhone. with an iphone really? <laughs> right uh, i thought you could do anything with an iphone here ned and now you tell me man well maybe, maybe it's less than perfect <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen with iphones as far as um <laughs> as far as the uh, so-called trade war is concerned. It, the best I've been able to see is they're going to have to raise the price 
about $200 each. Eh, let him eat cake. But, so if you thought you were being dowed <laughs> at, at $1,200 per night, then you're probably going to think you're going to be gouged by, by uh, at $1,400 a full. No doubt. No doubt. The consumer pays for everything, right? That's right. And uh, the consumer and the taxpayer. Now you can't, in this, the alternatives, you know, uh, Google just stabbed Howie in the heart. I saw that. I don't that. know what the name is of Google's phone. It's, the Google phone. Well, they bought Motorola, and now it's... But they well, renamed it, yeah, didn't they? Yeah, I don't remember what it's called, but it's not that important. <laughs> this is not that important, uh, what they call it. It's an also-ran in phones. It really is. Um, you know, it's... Uh, but, yeah. but Google stabbed Howie's phone business in the heart this morning. And they're not going to be able to sell one outside China anymore. Yeah, well, I don't so, know if that's good or bad, but China can't be happy because they plan to take over the world's 5G, right? That's right. Right. Yeah, the Google well, Pixel. Sure, maybe sometime you can explain the 5G to me. As far as I can tell, all it means I'll be able to download a stupid movie faster. Yeah, well, that's important, you know? It's important that okay. you can download those YouTubes faster, those censored YouTube videos so yeah google fi you know there's a bunch of different google phones um some people like them there's nothing wrong with them there's just nothing great about them um well it makes it easier for google to record all your life oh that's the key you know and that's what they're doing let's face it i mean we all know this right there's no secret here that that's what they're doing and uh well anyways well, we're having a lot of fun here, Ned, and uh, make sure you go check out Ned's work at the Value View Gold Report and the AgriFood Value View, a must reading, a uh, questions, comments, email kl at com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network, and whether you're listening to a podcast or you're watching a YouTube, please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps me a lot when you do it. If you had been listening to Ned six, eight months ago when he explained the emerging swine flu and what was happening with the grains, you probably could have made a fortune. So that's another reason that you need to like, share, subscribe. Ned, we'll talk to you again real soon, my friend. Thanks so much. Okay. Goodbye, Gary. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.